Hello, my name is Dr. Leon Creaney. I'm a consultant in sport and exercise medicine in Manchester, UK. I run my practice uh, largely around the Manchester private hospitals and also Cheshire. There are my details. I wanted to talk to you today about the overtraining injury. Uh, this has uh, various names and it does depend to some degree on which country you're in. Um, in the UK, it can be referred to as unexplained underperformance syndrome. Um, more commonly in uh, the USA, uh, Australia and Europe, it would be known as uh, overtraining syndrome. Um, this is a diagnosis that we can only reach after a period of medical uh, investigation. A athlete uh, may present with unexpected reduction in performance, tiredness and fatigue, and they need to be clinically evaluated. It cannot be assumed that it is purely uh, an overreaching, overtraining phenomenon, as there may be an underlying illness which is causing the um, problem. So... If after a period of medical investigation a diagnosis is found, then this underform, underperformance we would uh, obviously have explained. If, however, after a period of reasonable medical in investigation, uh, no underlying pathology is found, and this is simply thought to be um, a, an athlete uh, whose training has stretched them beyond their capacity, that's when we'd start to refer to this as the overtraining syndrome uh, or as I uh, think of it, uh, the overtraining injury. So just introducing some basic principles here. Uh, you must understand the overload principle of training. This is really the fundamental core concept of training science that any physiological system needs to be stretched beyond its capacity to encourage it to uh, increase uh, that capacity. So running within yourself will never make you fitter than what you are. You always have to push at the edges. Um, virtually all physiological systems can be trained. If you lift heavy weights, your muscles will get bigger and stronger. If you do lots of endurance running, your VO2 max and lactate threshold will improve. Uh, if you train for agility, your ability to change direction will improve over time. The stimulus has to be sufficient enough to uh, stretch that physiological system, uh, to encourage it to adapt. If you train within yourself, there's no real stimulus there. Uh, and the art and balance of training is about getting it right. Uh, whatever physiological stress you place on your system, your body then has to respond and it's in that recovery period that those new proteins are being made and all of the adaptation is taking place. So training cannot simply be uh, load, load, load. There has to be load, recovery, adaptation and a cycle. And what we see in people who are training uh, well is their baseline fitness uh, temporarily goes backwards uh, during and after a session when they introduce a uh, fatiguing training overload but in the recovery period uh, that adaptation takes place uh, and you actually overcompensate and come back better next time it's with repeated cycles like this that over time although uh, looking at it microscopically there are periods where you go down overall the trend should be towards improvement. However, when the uh, recovery is too little or the training load is too great, uh, there is insufficient recovery from one session to the next and that's when we can start to see an athlete going backwards. So different people uh, do uh, describe different stages of the overtraining syndrome. Obviously, stage one acute fatigue is where you would expect to be uh, after most training sessions and functional overreaching. You can see they're still colored in green is considered acceptable. Uh, and after a short period of rest, an athlete will bounce back. But more severe uh, non-functional overreaching is when uh, the athlete is not recovering and we start to see 
gradual impairments in performance. Once the full-on overtraining syndrome has set in, it can lead to very prolonged fatigue that can, on occasion, uh, take week, weeks or months uh, to recover from. So, the diagnosis of overtraining syndrome can be made uh, when somebody is otherwise medically healthy. Uh, they have a recurrent uh, performance decrement despite maintaining the normal training load. Uh, we have to uh, consider other factors here. Uh, so age-related decline, for example, you would not expect somebody over the age of 30 to be able to match uh, what they did at the age of 25. In fact, we know that after the age of 30, there is a 1% loss in natural endurance, uh, speed and strength per year. Uh, and also, we can't refer to what somebody's aspirations are. So, for example, if they said, I was aiming to run such and such a time this year and I haven't reached it, uh, you have to ask them, well, what, what was your actual previous best? Because if they're just having an aspiration to reach something that they haven't reached, um, that's not necessarily uh, overtraining syndrome. That's just... Uh, lack of insight of their abilities. So what do we actually see at a microscopic level in overtrained athletes? Um, so we had uh, some athletes in this study who were deliberately overtrained and they took biopsies of their muscle. They started to see increasing variation in the size of the muscle fibers, changes in the nuclei, the myonuclei of the muscle, uh, and damage to the connecting uh, Z discs. Um, and there was a positive association between these changes and the degree of uh, training intolerance that the endurance athletes uh, experienced. So the biopsy was taken from vastus uh, lateralis. These were the um, characteristics uh, of the controls and also the athletes. You can see they were similar in most regards apart from the uh, amount of training that they were doing. Uh, and these were differences between the two groups in terms of uh, different uh, aspects of the pathology. So for example uh, looking at graph A, uh, the variation in the myonuclei within muscle, uh, B the fiber size variation, uh, C, necrosis and inflammation of the muscle, uh, and D, um, uh, sub-sarcolemal aggregation within the mitochondria. And we can see the most marked difference there probably in the myonuclei. What does it actually look like under a microscope? Well, with increasing uh, levels of training intolerance, we can see we go from A, a very normal looking cross-section of muscle, uh, we can see increasing fibre disruption uh, and fat uh, and other changes. This was a study done on overtrained mice where they deliberately overtrained them progressively over a period of few weeks. Uh, the training load was unable to be maintained for these rats and over time you can see how their physical uh, work capacity despite regular training starts to go down. So what leads to the overtraining syndrome? Well, the key fault is the inability of athletes and coaches to adequately prescribe the correct amount of exercise. So training an athlete beyond what they're ready for. Um, it's often seen in uh, camps, for example, where people suddenly introduce a training load that they're not used to. Uh, or they try and train more often and uh, start cutting down on recovery or sleep. Um, or if they increase their training volume uh, to uh, a number of minutes, that's far greater than they've done uh, normally. Uh, but the universal finding is always a reduction in the ability to perform uh, tasks. So what we've learned is that a progressive increase in load over time rather than sudden sharp increases is what leads to uh, success in the long term. Here's a good example of progressive training over many years. 
this was uh, tracking Paula Radcliffe's uh, fitness in the years leading to the marathon world record. And we can see this gradual progression year in year in running economy and lactate threshold. There was no sudden jump. Uh, it was progressive over 10 years. So some further uh, histology to look at here. It changes in the muscle uh, of people who are overtrained. Uh, and we can see these very vital uh, cells uh, within muscle. They're called satellite cells. These are the, uh, if you like, pluripotent stem cells within muscle, uh, which uh, activate uh, to create new muscle fibers. They fuse um, together uh, to form uh, myoblasts, which become uh, new myofibers. These satellite cells are not replaceable, and if they're injured and damaged, uh, there is a permanent loss uh, of capacity within a muscle to uh, regenerate and respond uh, to a training stimulus. So what we're saying here is that an overtrained muscle can be permanently uh, damaged uh, and lose its training capacity. So going back to some histology here, we see uh, picture A, a very uh, normal looking muscle uh, on electron microscope, and we can see quite a damaged muscle in C there with a disruption of the fibers. Um, atrophy and um, disarray and uh, splitting. And there are also changes that start to be seen at the neuromuscular junction uh, with uh, potentially again uh, permanent damage to neuromuscular uh, transmission and coupling. Uh, that's all histological changes in the muscle. What about biochemistry? Well, overtraining again has been shown to uh, reduce activity uh, within the sarcoplasmic uh, reticulum of the calcium ATPase pump, which uh, obviously uh, will uh, have a knock-on effect because calcium is the excitation contraction coupler uh, within muscle. Uh, and prolonged elevation of calcium intracellularly can of course lead to apoptosis of uh, cells uh, and in this case muscle fibers. In the short term uh, this is responsible for DOMS delayed onset muscle soreness uh, and poor skeletal muscle uh, relaxation such as cramps uh, but in more severe cases the changes can be permanent. We also uh, see changes in the hormonal profile of athletes. So uh, in, under normal circumstances, uh, mechanical load or stretching does uh, stimulate the release of IGF-1 from muscles, uh, which is also known as mechanogrowth factor. Uh, and this stimulates satellite cell uh, proliferation uh, and growth of new muscle fibers. However, in overtrained athletes, uh, there is evidence of reduced uh, release of MGF in response to exercise. So we can see how this damage uh, might spread throughout a fast twitch uh, muscle fiber. We have uh, reduced satellite cell uh, populations, decreased synthesis rate of key muscular proteins, and uh, disordered calcium metabolism, uh, leading to impaired contractility uh, and um, muscle fiber atrophy. So this is why I refer to it as the overtraining injury. And in many ways, it has uh, parallels in other body systems and other pathologies that we see uh, in high level sport, um, it has parallels, for example, with exercise induced asthma, uh, which uh, is believed to be caught, caused by uh, frequent uh, breathing of cold, dry air and increased respiratory rates that people uh, with high training volumes uh, have to experience. Uh, we do, for example, see cardiac fibrosis and even potentially arrhythmias in some athletes as a reduce, as a, as a, 
result of exercise induced cardiac damage uh, obviously a great parallel there with tendinopathy which is essentially an overuse injury in tendons and stress fractures in bones and i do wonder sometimes if uh, so-called uh, spontaneous ligament ruptures there, there is actually in the background some degree of painless uh, ligament uh, atrophy uh, before these uh, ligaments suddenly snap uh, and obviously in meniscal cartilage we see age-related degenerative change so um, would you include the overtraining syndrome uh, within that category and I'm just expressing this here in a slightly different way the good news with muscle obviously and bone is that they uh, probably have the best regenerative capacity so if you break a bone it should heal if you tear a muscle generally speaking it regenerates back to normal tissue without significant scar tissue formation not so great obviously with tendons ligaments and cartilage um this uh, graph really comes from a paper uh, in uh, Nature Review's rheumatology around tendinopathy uh, but what we're looking at here is the body's uh, response to a training load both in terms of protein synthesis and protein degradation so obviously uh, when you train uh, you will do a degree of uh, microscopic damage to your body, body uh, and there is uh, some protein degradation and turnover in response to that that tends to peak within the first 24 hours uh, but exercise also has a anabolic uh, stimulus to it uh, which uh, peaks a little bit later when you combine the results of the results of those two uh, different processes happening at once the net result is that purple line in the middle and we can see it's believed to be net negative in that first 24 hours rebounding after about 36 hours so i do often uh, tell patients who are recovering and doing uh, therapeutic uh, exercises uh, to maybe not uh, train on a daily basis but allow a day uh, of training followed by a day of recovery so i do consider the overtraining injury to be a disease-like state it can be reproduced uh, in, in otherwise healthy individuals simply by overtraining them and certainly the rat experiments demonstrate that really clearly uh, but it can be done in humans too so it's probably important at this stage to introduce this concept of the acute to chronic workload ratio this is just as important for overtraining as it is for injuries uh, and what we're talking about here uh, essentially is that golden rule of never suddenly increasing the training intensity or volume um, but to increase it gradually and progressively over time uh, not only does a sudden spike in uh, training increase injury risk uh, but it certainly does increase uh, overtraining injury risk also and this graph here just illustrating that again showing how a sudden spike in acute to chronic workload ratio does result in a spike in injuries so obviously prevention is better than cure this is a nasty illness once it's set in so it's better off if we prevent uh, athletes getting it in the first place there is evidence uh, particularly from British uh, triathlon that if you closely monitor athletes, monitor athletes training loads uh, and uh, look out for the early warning signs not only with physiological data but also with questionnaires and psychological uh, data uh, if you spot uh, early overtraining uh, and identify that individual uh, and reduce their training load you can prevent it before it gets much worse um, I've said there uh, there is no uh, specific treatment uh, for overtraining syndrome other than uh, rest and graduated return to exercise there are some theoretical um, treatments uh, for example you'll have heard uh, in Germany of a substance called Activegan which is meant to be um, a sort of cell energizer uh, 
uh, used uh, uh, by uh, Muller Wolfhart. Um, it can be uh, obtained in the UK, it has to be imported uh, and it has to be used uh, off license because it's not a drug uh, that uh, is normally used in the UK. Uh, that is legal, um, but it has to be done uh, on a per patient basis. Uh, there is very limited evidence that Activegan uh, has an effect uh, outside of places like intensive care. Uh, but it has been tried in occasional people. Uh, obviously, uh, testosterone may have uh, an effect as well, but we introduce the doctrine of double effects here. Is the patient being given testosterone for performance enhancement or to recover from uh, an injury or illness? So studies here done in uh, older athletes, uh, testosterone introduced induced uh, increase in muscle size, in healthy young men uh, is associated with muscle fiber hypertrophy and we again see that potentially administration with testosterone can uh, restore uh, myonuclei um, that have been destroyed through overtraining And we see uh, some comparisons here. The myonuclei are those little uh, purple dots. And we see in response to testosterone therapy uh, an increase in the number of myonuclei. And this very famous study, uh, which was used by uh, WADA to increase the length of uh, drug suspensions, showed how um, prolonged anabolic steroid use certainly does increase uh, myonuclei number um, and that increased capacity uh, is retained uh, for many years after stopping uh, anabolic steroid use. So in summary, uh, the overtraining injury or exercise induced myopathy can be a permanent pathological state of muscle which uh, can take months to recover from uh, and sometimes uh, there is permanent change. This is largely mediated by uh, reduced uh, uh, stem cell population within muscles uh, which are very difficult to um, get back once they're gone. Uh, prevention is better than cure uh, and the key to successful training is progressive overload uh, over many years and adequate recovery rather than sudden spikes in training volume. Um, various treatments have been uh, purported as therapeutic agents in, the, in this condition, in particular anabolic steroids and active vegan. Um, however, these substances are prohibited uh, for use in elite and professional sport because of their performance enhancing effects. Many thanks for listening today. My name is Dr. Leon Creaney. I'm a consultant in sport and exercise medicine in Manchester, UK, and I am continuing to see patients face to face and uh, remotely via Zoom during COVID-19.